Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Selling Greenville, your favorite real estate podcast here in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm your host, as always, Stan McCune, realtor right here in the Greenville area, and you can find all of my contact information in the show notes if you need to reach out to me for any of your real estate needs. Just a reminder, housekeeping as always, please like, rate, review, subscribe, all of those good things to the show if you enjoy this content. And like I said, please use me as your realtor with that contact information in the show notes. Today, I am excited to have as a guest on this show on Selling Greenville, Pope Brooks, uh, who I've been friends with for, I don't know, probably close to 10 years now. Um, yeah. We've been friends since before I was a realtor. I know that much. And I've been a realtor for eight years. So um, it, it it honestly, it goes back even a few years before that. But this yep. whole time, uh, Hope has been one of those uh, kind of under the radar players in local real estate investing, not someone whose name is out there uh, a, a lot. I doubt that uh, you'll hear Hope's name out there a whole lot, but someone who's partnering with a lot of the people whose names are out there a lot. Um, and kind of under underpinning a lot of uh, a lot of other people who have those outward facing brands uh, that make you you know that may or may not appear to be doing a lot of things um, regardless of what might be happening underneath the surface. Um, so hope is kind of under the radar, helping a lot of uh, and partnering with a lot of other people in our local industry here. And in, in addition to that, um, I want to say. A little bit of background on, on Hope real quick. She's a former automotive professional for a long time, a current yoga instructor, a cancer warrior, which we will get to later in the show, uh, mother of two, and someone that generally speaking, you don't want to get on <laughs> the wrong side of, which thankfully hasn't happened to me yet. <laughs> so all of that said, Hope, welcome to the show. Thank you for being on today. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate you having me. <laughs> So this is going to be a little bit of a different show. Um, a random dude who I didn't realize I was friends with on Facebook. And admittedly, um, I'm not on Facebook as much as it might appear. Um, I use Facebook like some people use LinkedIn. So I kind of will accept a lot of friend requests from people that I don't necessarily know. But anyway, a random dude I didn't know on Facebook, uh, but that I happen to be friends with on Facebook, recently went after Hope and me on Facebook uh, because we own rental properties, God forbid. Um, and I thought, you know what? This is a teachable moment. First off, it's a teachable moment because you don't mess with hope. Uh, but also, this is a teachable moment because there's a ton of ignorance about just owning rental properties in general. And I think it would be good for us to have a little fun on the show. And I used to do this a lot back when I first started the show. It it I, It used to be a little bit more of a wild card, what my episodes would be like. I had a lot of fun fun shows back then we're kind of rolling back the clock here and we're going to roast real estate ignorance in a teachable manner um we're not gonna i'm not gonna roast the guy we're gonna we're not gonna talk about his name i've got you know i'm gonna share some screenshots i redacted out uh his name and whatnot we're not gonna make fun of him although we kind of are it's more we're gonna make fun of his talking points which are common talking points among a lot of people on social media right now who don't understand uh what it's like to rent or be a landlord um and so um, I, I I just want to make sure that everyone understands how uh, how we're approaching that. So I guess let's start with this. My initial Facebook post literally said this. This is my Facebook post. What I've learned about it on social media is when I it, it's usually the things that I think are the least controversial that become the most controversial. I don't understand that. You probably hope you've probably seen that on <laughs> on, on some of my posts. Um, yes. But um. Here's what my post said. I said, just doled out the cash for the property taxes for my rentals. Whomever salary I just paid for this year, you're welcome. That's it. That was that was my post. And I thought, generally speaking, everyone hates property taxes. Um, and, and most people do. Most people responded uh, agreeing with me. Hope responded agreeing with me with how ridiculous the Greenville property tax structure is. And then this guy just went off, off the rails like, on me. On hope, it was it was kind of uh, it was kind of hilarious to see, and I and I knew shortly thereafter that um, that I would be hearing from hope, and sure enough, like I was in the process of sending you a text message, and uh, and then you sent me one uh, before I even had a chance to uh, 
to <laughs> send one to you. So I'm curious when that went down, what was your just initial reaction? Well, when I first read your post and I see often, you know, what you post and it's pretty clear every time. And I don't always comment. This one got me because I do feel like real estate taxes are, are property taxes are ridiculous. You're continuing to pay and pay and pay and they always increase them. And then you add to that, if you own a second home, not even necessarily a rental property, just maybe you did well enough to have a second home and you're paying extra. You're, you're paying basically double the tax for that. So I don't, I've never liked the premise of how that's set up in this particular state. It's different state to state. So I immediately was like, I don't like that either. And I don't like the fact that they charge us more for a property we're not as a primary residence. <clears throat> which I thought, and I gave my explanation as to why. And it has, not, even if I didn't own a property, I've never agreed with it. And this guy decided to chime in. And he doesn't know me. He does now. He did block us. So he did block us. <laughs> he did, us, he did block noticed. us. Yes. I, he did I, block us. I knew that was going to happen. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I initially thought this was a great place to like engage some conversation about property, real estate taxes and such. Never thought somebody was going to go off the rails like that especially somebody who was uneducated. And then it highlighted to me the same thing I've seen other people say to my face. Sometimes they assume a certain thing because I own a rental property. Most people, like you said, don't know that I do things kind of under the covers and behind the scenes. Yep. I'm not outwardly, you know, buying 50 properties a year, but I do other things and that works for my life. And it has become a place where like you and I have worked together We've been friends a long time. It opened the door. You were the first person I ever worked with and took that chance on. And it was it was invaluable to me to learn about that. So yeah, I just really 100%. saw that when I texted you. I was like, people really don't understand what it takes to be a landlord, whether you own one or a hundred properties. Yeah, and you and I were <laughs> talking uh, before we started recording here uh, about how I've seen on social media um, you know, it's mostly Gen Zers, I guess, but uh, younger crowd that still hasn't owned their first home that are in that renting cycle. And I keep seeing people say things like landlords need to get real jobs. And it's like, we have real jobs. Um, and anyway, I've got uh, I've got the the screenshot pulled up here of one of the comments that that this person made. I'm just going to read it for those that aren't able to. Uh, see this on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the screenshot. Um, if you're not, and I'm and I'm gonna uh, because uh, it it makes our picture look pretty small because we're recording this in Zoom. Not going to show the screenshot the whole time, uh, but we're going to be talking through this. So uh, here's what this person said uh, to Hope: the property tax actually encourages. We always know reply guys are their favorite word is actually. Um, <laughs> The property tax actually encourages primary home ownership instead of greedy landlords who wish to profit off other people's hard work. If you don't like the higher tax rate, don't own rentals. Let's be honest, you'd pocket the difference as profit. I'd also add you don't pay it. Your renters do. You're simply a middleman. If y'all were seriously interested in the rising cost of housing, you'd be against so much investment in residential properties. You want servitude, not freedom. It's a guy that doesn't even know you. He's, he's, telling, he's telling you that you want servitude, not freedom. Servitude. <laughs> um, I believe my actual response to him was one, because I bullet point, you don't know me. And I had two subsequent bullet points so that I was very clear because actually I don't need that word in my <laughs> response. <laughs> yeah, you did. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll go to your screenshot <laughs> here in, in a second. Um, he went on to say, or, or maybe be against Section 8 housing uh, rentals and payment collections, which many people offer to keep certain populations oppressed. But instead, let's have a pity party for you and your investment portfolio. When I see you come out for everyone, all caps, for everyone first, owning a primary residence before anyone owns a secondary property, then maybe I'll give some legitimacy to your argument. Greed like yours takes many forms. Okay, a lot, <laughs> a lot to unpack here. Okay. Let me start by saying this. He said the property tax actually, of course, uh, I'm going to uh, highlight that word again, <laughs> encourages uh, primary home ownership instead of greedy landlords who wish to profit off of other people's hard work. The first part of that sentence is somewhat legitimate, right? The property tax structure does encourage primary home ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but he immediately jumps into instead of greedy landlords who wish to profit off of other people's hard work. I, I'm I'm curious. So we need people to rent. People, not everyone can be a homeowner. Some people, ha like most people start renting, right? Did did, mm -hmm. did you rent before you owned? Yes, I rented with two other people because I could not afford a place on my yes, own. And so I was did, 18. So did I. Let's be honest. Yeah. My, my first place, I also rented with two other people. Same <clears> reason. It wasn't, uh, and, and even after I got married, the first year that we were married, uh, Michelle and I rented. And, um... And then, you know, we granted I graduated in 2008, Great Recession. You know, that wasn't exactly mm -hmm. the best time in the world to uh, qualify for a mortgage because uh, I would have been a homeowner sooner. Could I have been? But long story short is it never occurred to me like we need to get rid of landlords like these people are are greedy. I needed mm -hmm. a place to rent. Like if I didn't have a like, how do you rent if there aren't going to be landlords? I, I truly don't understand what people are thinking these days. And, and it goes along too. It's not just private landlords. There's always somewhere to rent. There were apartments for as and, long and as you can go back for decades. That's landlord in a corporate fashion. Yep. Nobody's bashing them. So why would a private landlord be bashed? And for me, you, what it took you to get your first home, it took me eight years to buy my first home. I graduated in 1990 and I didn't buy my first home until 1998. Wow. So- it, it wasn't I, I, my options in between renting and sharing spaces was living in my car or sleeping on somebody's couch and then giving them some cash until I could get my next place. That's what people don't understand is that space had not been there for me to crash on somebody's couch and give them some money or rent with two other girls or eventually get my own apartment where I could actually afford it and then eventually get a home. That's eight years from my high school graduation before I owned a home. I went through multiple jobs. I worked multiple jobs to be able to get to that point and afford it. I bought the cheapest place. It was, I think the house I bought was $98,000. <laughs> it was a small town house. It was 1,100 square feet. I was not rich. This was just like, I had a great job by then. I finished college, you know, doubling down. I was able to do that. So, But had I not had a rental place, where would I have been? I couldn't go home. I was not allowed. So I couldn't go to my mom's basement or extra bedroom and live there and be cushy and happy and comfortable and drive a nice car. I drove an old beater. <laughs> but before you uh, before you started doing the uh, uh, brushless car washes. <laughs> That's right. That is right. Um, yeah. Uh, to your point, um, uh, you probably already know this, but the average first time home buyer is now between 35 and 36 years old which is insane. So that means people are either living with their parents or renting until they're roughly 35 or 36 now. Um, and I, I don't know like what people think. I, I, I guess it's not so much that they truly are like landlords shouldn't exist. I just think that they think that landlords are just making tons and tons of money. <laughs> I've got a reality uh, check for some people out there. I've had rental properties that were negative cash flow multiple, multiple times. I'm not proud of that. Um, that's not something that I like, but it, it happens sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. a, a property doesn't perform. Um, and guess what? When you're a landlord, you can't just all of a sudden say, you know what? This isn't performing. I'm going to give up on it. You, you are still obligated to uphold your lease agreement with your mm -hmm. tenants to keep that property in good condition, if you choose to not keep it in good condition, then it's going to lose value. And then the entire idea of an investment is sunk. So it's just kind of ridiculous. And this, I'm going to reshare this um, again here. He said, with regard to the higher tax rate, let's be honest, you'd pocket the difference as profit. Now, I want to, I want to, this was one of my favorite things that he said, because I, I was trying to understand. Okay, so... If rates weren't higher, right, then we would somehow still be able, if the property tax rates weren't as high as they are for rental properties, he's suggesting that we would be able to create a new market that is still us charging rent at the rate that we're currently charging it with the higher tax rate, but we're pocketing the difference. That is not how the free market so works. So wrong. <laughs> that is so wrong. And let me give you an example. So the home I own right now that has tenants in it that I've had for 
three and a half years. I bought it in the middle of the pandemic when nothing was open. That's apparently who I am. I, crisis of life, let's just buy a house. Um, and I bought a fully renovated house, so I didn't have to do anything to it. So I paid a little bit more money for it. Well, it because the home was unlivable prior to the builder who renovated it, by the time the property tax adjusted, I had owned the home for a year and some change. So when my property tax adjusted up for a higher value of the home, it was double what the home used to be valued at. And I'm at 6% because it's yeah. not my primary. Which is three times made money. the, yes. which, which at the end of the day is, is three. Sometimes I've seen sometimes three and a half times what the owner occupied rate is. So when I bought the home and I had two people that were viable to rent it, one of them worked out. I was fair in market value for that home, even though it was nicer than anything else on the street because it had been renovated. By the time it adjusted, I was already in that contract with my tenant and he was going to extend one to two more years. We had already talked about it. So I wasn't price gouging him. So what do you think happened? You're talking about negative. I was barely breaking even per the per month. And when something happened and needed to be repaired, that was just out of pocket costs for me. Yep. So then it took another year for that to settle in and adjust. So here I am in year three and it's finally kind of balanced out. Three years in, I haven't yep. skipped a mortgage. I haven't shorted the tenants. When they needed something, I made sure that it was there because they worked directly with me. I don't have multiple properties, so I don't really have a reason to pay someone else to manage it for me. I can handle it. I'm very open with my tenants about what they need, what I can give them, and I'm fair in the market value of the actual home's rental price for the area. And it's downtown. Yeah, you can't you can't create <clears throat> like a new yeah. market. Like you can't if if every you know twelve hundred square foot house is renting for. $1,400, you can't just all of a sudden come in and be like, well, I'm going to rent mine for $1,700. Like, that's right. just not how it works. It's a, and it's maybe a free market if the, at the end of the day. If the taxes were adjusted down, then we wouldn't have to add a little bit more to it. Well, here, we're trying so, to deal with everything. There's We're not just, the renters don't deal with anything except so for keeping it clean and, and pest extermination stuff. Yep. Well, let's let's talk about what would happen. Let's say that Greenville County and or South Carolina as a whole, because it's really more of a state thing than the county collects the taxes, but the state kind of sets it mm -hmm. uh, to a certain extent. So um, let's say that tomorrow Greenville County lowered property taxes on rental properties from the six percent to the four percent rate, which would, you know, effectively make landlords pay a third of the taxes that they're currently paying. Here's what would happen. Yes, for for the duration of the lease agreements, landlords would be profiting, would be would be pocketing that money. Mm -hmm. After those lease agreements expired, someone has property that isn't renting out for whatever reason, sitting for longer than they're comfortable with, which is happening more and more frequently right now because we've actually had an apartment boom in, in our country. Mm -hmm. People complain about that in Greenville. It's actually way less in Greenville than it is in other parts of the country. <laughs> um, but rent prices are actually starting to go down a little bit uh, nation on a nationwide scale because of this. Um, and, and so what happens in that situation when a landlord's costs go down, they become more interested in eliminating vacancies than they yep. are in squeezing out profit. So rents would actually start to go down. Some land, it would start with a few landlords, landladies at first, they would start charging less. The apartments would probably be the first ones that they would start charging less. And then eventually we would all have to charge less because mm -hmm. we're all paying less. And so this whole idea that uh, we would profit, uh, pocket the difference as profit, first off, there's nothing wrong with profiting. <laughs> like No. Um, but- Here's another thing I want to say before I get too off topic here. I have most of the rentals that I bought over the years were rental properties before I bought them. Mm -hmm. And I I'm usually inheriting tenants. And in, in some cases, I'm talking directly to the previous landlord. Those people are some of the poorest people I've communicated with. There was one landlord that I bought uh, a few duplexes from, and I had to go to his house to uh, to reconcile something. and he lived in a mobile home that was falling apart in a trailer park that he owned. The whole trailer park was falling apart. And 
and the trailer park was in like a junkyard. Like that is <laughs> how he was living. Um, and so I bought it. I, I bought these two duplexes. They were all falling apart as well, obviously, because the landlord's house was falling apart. And I completely fixed them up. And of course, I charged more rent after that. I had put in a ton of my own money mm -hmm. and sweat equity um, into doing that. And so um, so anyway, that uh, I don't know a whole lot of people that are just greedy landlords just making tons and tons of money off of rental properties. It just doesn't exist. Um, mm -hmm. I was Nick, if 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 Nick is listening, um, who uh, if if you want to if you're friends with me on Facebook, you'll see Nick comment on some of my stuff. I think maybe he even commented on this thread. But um, Nick and and Lawrence and some others that I know um, are, are are starting to sell off rental properties because they can't make money. It's hard mm -hmm. to make money with the current tax structure. So. Um, <laughs> So anyway, this is a problem that Greenville needs to uh, to figure out and the state needs to figure out because it it if we start to see uh, landlords and landladies start to sell off properties, that is actually going to cause rent to go up. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. that's the what's going to actually happen, um, unlike what this person thinks, which is that, you know, we shouldn't be landlords uh, because we're, we're just greedy. Well, uh, and then also look at it from this, the renter's perspective. If you're, if you're working toward buying a house or maybe you just want to rent the rest of your life, some people do that and that's great. But what about the places that won't take your size family or the dog that you have? Mm -hmm. yep. You know, those are places where you are instantly denied a place to live, even if you could afford it. And it costs more because it was a downtown apartment, but you need to go find a private landlord because you have a dog or two and you need a, a fenced yard or you need somewhere to put your tools in a shed. Those are the types of things that this guy didn't even consider with his asinine comment and his no knowledge about the rental industry at all, clearly. <laughs> but that's things that people don't talk about. I mean, people that are in my home, both my tenants, my one I had for three years and my current one, both have dogs. They both have breeds that would not have been allowed at an apartment, nor would it have been easily accessible for them to get the dog in and out of the house. My yard is fenced. When I bought the home, it wasn't completely fenced. So I extended the fence across the front of the home to help make my property more viable for that demographic because most people have dogs. Yeah, and you know you're you're mentioning all these different things you had to do. I, I love that you said that we're just a middleman, like <laughs> we're the middleman that had enough credit, equity, and money right. to buy the house. Exactly, exactly. Um, but I mean, I, I can't tell. So I think a lot of people that are, are like anti landlord right now. I think that they think that that we that the average landlord doesn't actually have a job. Like I, I referenced that earlier. So I've only known in my life a handful of people that their only job was managing their own rental portfolio. Every one of those got out of that because it was too exhausting and did not make enough money. Mm -hmm. You can there are so many better ways to make money out there. It's just rental properties are an investment product. I've told people before, I'm, I'm, I never give investment advice. But generally speaking, what I hear in from investment advice is don't put all your money in one thing, right? I used mm -hmm. to have all of my money in real estate. And then I realized, you know what, I'm not very diversified here. Um, and and so I've had to to diversify a bit. But all of these apparent people that think that these landlords are out here um, and all they're doing is just sitting around all day, you know, collecting rent, not having to do anything. Like how many of those people exist? Because all the ones that I know of, they've gotten out of it. I don't know. Do you know any? No, because every realtor that I know that I'm friends with, that I have worked with, every one of them has, a, they're either a realtor as a full-time job or they're a broker, mm -hmm. or it's somebody like me who I worked my way through automotive and then automotive industrial software. And I worked my whole life for, I don't know, 30 something years full time to get to this point. And I'm the opposite of you. I was diversified in different areas, mm -hmm. but had no real estate portfolio 
but was able to invest to be able to diversify my portfolio away from like the market and the standard things, 401ks that people invest in, because the ROI is not as high on those and it's much more risky. Real estate is probably, in my opinion, the least risky. Mm -hmm. And I, I will qualify that I've owned four of my own homes. So also this gentleman did not know that. <laughs> I started with my 90 something thousand dollar home. I made $400 on that house when I sold it. And I lived in it for uh, seven years. Wow. Seven years. And I basically sold it for what I bought it for. That's crazy. And I had made an improvement. When, when did you purchase? <clears throat> what year? I bought it in 98 and I sold it in 2003. Okay. That's interesting. So maybe the dot-com bubble had something to do with that. Maybe. And I think location, um, you know, cause I, when I first moved to this area, I didn't really know, but that's, that was a place I could afford. So I mm -hmm. bought a place mm -hmm. versus I had rented all those years. I was like, I don't want to keep throwing rent away. My, one of my parents was a realtor. So I kind of knew eventually you need to buy something and have mm -hmm. some equity, but I had to work my way to that. And then I owned a second home and that one was like what you're talking about. It needed a little bit of work. It had been abandoned for six months and I put the work into the house I sold it and made a profit, built another house with like, you know, a standard builder, track builder. And then I sold that house and moved in where I'm at now. So I'm four homes deep before I ever bought my first rental home from 1998 to 2020. And that's, that's, I think <clears throat> pretty much everyone's story, right? Like yeah. I, the, no, no landlords just go out and start <clears throat> buying rental properties before they, they bought their own house. Like we're right. And this, this is why I tell people all the time. <clears throat> on the show, because I advocate for home ownership on the show. I think people should break break the rent cycle. But I also own rental properties. But I actually, you know, the, this dude he alluded to the fact that I'm anti home ownership. I am a realtor. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't I don't make hardly any money off my rental properties in comparison no. to what I make as a realtor. Like this is my full time job. I couldn't quit this and just manage my rental portfolio and that be that it just doesn't work that way um all right i'm gonna pull up because we're uh we're getting short on time okay. here and i want to respect your time i'm gonna pull up another screenshot um here's the one where you went through your bullet points you don't know <laughs> me you clearly drank your haterade this morning don't ever <laughs> speak to me or anyone with this level of disrespect and for invest in therapy because i'm not here to be bullied or verbally assaulted by your unresolved issues and anger problems <laughs> i'm not sure who. And that's true yeah and someone did some kind of a laughing i think that that was him actually that did that laughing response like a, a you know like a <laughs> like he like he knows something that we don't kind oh of oh my god kind of thing um and so he responded hope brooks you're here to complain i get it when someone calls you on your complaining you play the victim again he knows you so well you chose to have rentals your choice don't complain about the taxes for things you voluntarily entered into. Feel free to project more if you need. Uh, what kind of an argument is that? I, I don't know. He inserted words like projection that he doesn't even understand <laughs> where they should be placed in a sentence. So my minor in English is kind of irking me right now listening to that being read again. He he, um, he it, heard about that somewhere online. He was on Reddit. Oh my and, gosh. And he heard this is, this is the way to, to try to argue with people. And I do think that... And, I get that the cost of living right now is outrageous and homes are outrageous, but they were outrageous for people in 1965 who, when you could buy a brand new car for what, I don't know, three, $4,000. Yeah, something like well, that. That's like $30,000 now or $40,000 mm -hmm. now. Same thing with homes. I can remember my dad telling me that first house was, I don't know, 18 or $20,000 in like 1969. Well, it was a 2000 square foot home in a nice neighborhood in Northern Indiana. Yeah, it was expensive, but he had a great job. And I look at it now too, even all as I graduated high school in the nineties, was it cheap? No. At the time, I don't know, $900 for rent or mm -hmm. eight or $900 for a one bedroom. And I mean, one bedroom and very small. I think people forget that this is scalable. Everything's going up in price. Mm -hmm. It isn't just one thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where they're getting hung up is thinking that we're over here making millions some people probably are. I am not that person. I like my rental property. I love the property. If it was a big enough house, I'd probably move into it myself. But I like the 
owning a home. I like investing in real estate. I like working in transactions that do things for my wallet because I am here to make money. I can't live without an income, period. And whether that is working in automotive or that is doing yoga teaching like I do now, I diversify where my income comes from in order to afford the things I need to afford for myself and my children. And I'm trying to build wealth. I'm trying to leave a little bit of a legacy for my kids so that they don't grow up and have absolutely nothing like I never existed on this planet. I want them to be proud of what I put into it to make their life have a nice foundation to start off on. Am I giving yeah, them everything? 100%. Absolutely not. You know me better than that. <laughs> um, Braxton actually starting a job in a couple of weeks. So nice. I was really excited about that. Um, and it's through the school. But I want Great. my children to feel valuable. They see what I go through. I'm a single parent. They see what I've done. They know that it's possible. I don't want them ever to think at 18 that they can't go do something or 20, that they need to be still living in the bedroom that I'm providing for them. I want them to be autonomous, be able to make decisions, to critically think. This gentleman clearly did not get taught that. No, uh, and um, <clears throat> I should have mentioned before the, well, I'll pull, I'll pull it back up. I, I'm going to go back to that first screenshot here again. Um, he actually, it, what's funny is he actually contradicted himself at one point. So he said that we would make more profit we we would just make more profit if property taxes were lower. But then he also said, um, let me look at this. I'd also add, you don't pay it, your renters do, referring to the property taxes. Well, um, I actually agree with that. That's the whole point. That's that's the whole thing when it comes to like why when I'm trying to uh, you know, when I'm doing my behind the scenes political stuff why we want property taxes to go lower isn't to benefit the landlords. It's actually to benefit the people renting because yes. all of those costs end up, they do get passed through to the renter. So he's actually right about that point. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, when that goes up, when property taxes go up, landlords have to raise their rent to account for the property tax increases. Like otherwise it doesn't make sense to have a rental. Right. So then the landlord sells that rental. Now there are fewer rentals on the market. And now everyone else can raise their prices because there is less supply and yep. but the same amount of demand. Again, basic economics that uh that people just don't understand when they're making this type of, of argumentation. And the, just like with I can use my house as an example. Like the time it took for that property tax to finally adjust and come to me. And my bottom line, I didn't change the lease in the middle of it. I sucked it up. That's what you do. Yep. And then the next year, I explained to my tenant, yes, I'd love to do another year with you, but this is going to be the cost. He did not look at me like I was crazy. He said, you have been very fair to me. And I understand everything goes up in cost. He signed the next lease. I had him for three years. Same thing with the people I have now. This is your, you know, cost this is what the i'm including like a fee for an animal like whatever it is because at the end of the day when they leave i have to make sure that home is in exceptional shape for the next person that comes in because i don't want someone living in filth or things that are broken i'm going to make sure to invest that yeah 100 percent. and and that <laughs> and you know south carolina is a pretty landlord friendly state but we still have to honor our lease agreements right yep. so that's like when a landlord signs that lease agreement that's a that's a commitment that the landlord is making as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people don't realize that. They think that that we can, you know, set the rules, we can break the rules, we can do all of that. All <laughs> right. Here's here's the last um here's the last thing that that I really loved. Have you ever he he, he asked me this, Stan McEwen, uh -huh. have you ever seen the Amish? who work to take care of their neighbors <laughs> instead of taking advantage of them. What? <laughs> so I did try to comment to that because there's plenty of Amish country I could introduce them to, but he had already blocked us by then. <laughs> and I couldn't reply. Well, and I, and I, what's funny is um, like, there were a lot of ways I, I did reply to him. There are a lot of ways that I was thinking about replying. One is that, yes, I, I actually have seen and known many Amish over the years. I've been to Lancaster. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up not very far from there. I saw the whole Amish community. We did a field <laughs> trip to see them. Like they were like a relic or something <laughs> <laughs> with all due respect. Cause I, I do appreciate the Amish community, but it is funny how people will go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and 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 look at them like like they're in a museum or something. Uh -huh. um, 
but uh, but I have no idea what this means. Like, is he suggesting that our the only thing I could conclude was that he was suggesting we should be have a more socialistic system rather than a capitalistic system. And that's how I responded. I was like, it, what did I say? I was like, I, I said to him, what, what did the Amish have to do with this brother? If socialism is what you want, we have that in many other places in the world. Yes. Go to one of those other places. We don't have a system. The Amish are, are an ethno religious group, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, I, I, I don't know. Are, are we, is he suggesting that landlords are supposed to be just giving out housing to people? Is that, like, uh, how does that work? I, I, that's what I'm trying to figure out because how are we supposed to go build a house and then just give it away? And you and I and, and this guy build this house and just give it to somebody? Just give it away. Is he going to just give his big truck to somebody? Well, and I've, no, and I've had the director not. of Greenville Homeless Alliance on here and there's a lot of nonprofits that are doing that kind of thing. But it, it someone has to pay for it, right? Who's having right. to pay for it? Taxpayers and volunteers pay for it. Exactly. They pay for it out of their money. They fundraise. Um, they go hands on and and build the houses themselves or find a home that can be renovated. So it's it's you know donations and fundraisers and you know nonprofits that are helping with that. And then you or I or whoever can participate physically go and do that as well. He could do that. So it, the cost has to come from somewhere. Like I I don't know the. the these are just kind of the, I, I, I think that where we're at right now, and, and I've talked about this a few times, I think there's just, there's a lot of people getting squeezed financially, mm -hmm. and perhaps this person is one of them, and they're just looking for someone to blame. Mm -hmm. And the, rea the reality is, it's not that there's no one to blame. I'm, I'm not going to say that there's no one to blame, but, but the targets, generally speaking, the people that are being blamed are the easy ones to go after. Like everyone knows landlords, everyone knows rental properties. They're not paying attention to what's going on at the World Economic Forum, where literally global elites are talking about doing all sorts of things that would crush the 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 people at the bottom. Like mm -hmm. that's where that's where they need to be focused on. What's going on, you know, at the in, in Davos when they have that World Economic Forum you know, all these billionaires come together and all these world leaders come together and talk about how they're going to take money from all of us. That's mm -hmm. where if you want to blame someone, I'm not saying everything that goes on at Davos is, is a problem. And I'm, all, and I'm not suggesting in case for those that might take it there, I'm not saying billionaires are a problem either. But at the end of the day, it's the rich that oppress the poor and landlords mm -hmm. aren't in that rich class, generally speaking. Yes, normally the, not. The, yeah, the super wealthy, they do have real estate, but m it's the number is something like uh, I think it's I think it's something like 90 percent of landlords own fewer than four properties. We are the mm -hmm. average landlord, like the people, mm -hmm. people like you, people like me. It's not people like Warren Buffett. He He's not your stereotypical landlord. Um, mm -hmm. And so. I'm glad that this person gave us a forum to <laughs> uh, to be able to roast these ideas because they they are ridiculous. And I, probably most of the people listening to the show are not anti landlord, or anti renting or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but there's a pretty good chance that you're going to people listening are going to run into these types of arguments at some point. Um, mm -hmm. And it's good to know that these crazies are out there. And and be yeah. careful because I'm someone that argues like that with a stranger on social media. Like, I don't want to run into that person on the street. Yeah, because I was immediately like, how do you know this guy? And, yeah. you know, I, I researched I, him and I was like, we've got like 17 people in common. And then yep. he vanished off social media because he blocked us. <laughs> so that tells you a lot right there. But I do. Yeah. I think there's a misconception. And like I said, people have talked to me about that. They don't understand how I've been able to do all the things that I've done they never saw the behind the scenes work. They never saw when I was driving the old beater that leaked oil and worked two jobs, you know, retail and well, I was a welder. I didn't have a glamorous job. Sometimes you just have to take the job that pays you what you need to get paid to go to the next step. And so people don't really see that. They see the end result. They yep. see that Stan right now has a really nice truck. Well, they didn't see when you were driving your Subaru <laughs> for 10 years. What, what about the Sentra? Probably... Do you remember the Sentra with no bumper? <laughs> 
I don't. (laughs) But yes, I'm like, you just have to put it in perspective. Everybody needs somewhere to live. If I had not been able to rent, share rent spaces with people, I don't know where I would be right now because I couldn't have afforded it. And in the in-between space, like I said, I couldn't always afford it. So I'm on somebody's sofa or maybe I spent a night or two in my car. That didn't last long, but it was stuff that happened to me. And that's what people don't understand. I'm not over here. I'd love to get rich. If this would make me get completely rich and and retired, that'd be great. I'm kind of semi-retired if you want to get into that right now, but a little semi-retired right now. But that affords me something that I enjoy doing. I like learning about it. It was a hard learning curve in the first this first house I owned with the change of the tax and how long it took for that. I kept kind of like, I knew it was going to change, but then it wasn't. And then it was like, oh, here it is. Yeah, and depend- then that depending wiped on out when anything. you buy, you can get up to two years before that before that. Yep. And that's kind of, I bought in June. So it kind of took a little while for it to cycle through. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do well, I treat my tenants well. I offer a nice space. I want to continue to be able to do that for what I feel like is a reasonable amount of rent for someone current, the current tenants are looking to buy a home, hopefully by next year, maybe not. If not, they at least have a safe, clean place to live that is affordable and it allows them to have their pet. So there's a whole lot of perks to it as well. 100%. So we're getting towards the end of our time here. I had mentioned earlier that you're a cancer warrior. Um, Mm -hmm. I suspect there are people listening to the show that know you and maybe did not know that you have been battling cancer now, uh, diagnosed with stage four cancer. How many months ago? 22 months. It'll be two years, April 1st. Okay. Stage four colorectal cancer. Um, So I'm going to share in the show notes a link to Hope's Give and Kind link for anyone that wants to contribute. Hope is a single mom battling cancer to be uh, be alive for her kids and uh, has been battling stage four cancer now for 22 months. I'll let you give an update here in a second. But before that, I want to mention that I will include that link if you want to contribute to Hope or her family, um, or if you just want to see her story, she's got incredible information on there. I lost my father to cancer last year, um, and seeing Hope's story and how how she had to approach her cancer and and all of that, it really helped me to better understand what my dad was going through and what was kind of going on in his body because he took a very different kind of non invasive approach um, mm-hmm. because he had other uh, other health issues. Um, but I will include that in the show notes. If you want to, if you want to look into that and I would encourage any of you guys, I don't ever ask you guys to give me money outside of using me as your realtor. I am asking if you could donate towards hope and her family. Um, with all that said, any sort of, if anything you want to say with regard to that, this is your forum. Um, so I was diagnosed April 1st of 2022. Um, Everybody that does know me knows that I'm the poster child for health. Everything in moderation. I've worked on my health my entire adult life uh, to avoid bad habits. And it was a shock to me, probably even more so to the community of the fitness people that I'm friends with and that I see every single day. Um, But colorectal cancer doesn't discriminate, neither does any other cancer. And I can't pinpoint one thing. I just know that one day I felt great. And a few weeks later, I didn't feel great. And a few weeks after that, they figured out what was wrong with me. It was very quick onset. I didn't have a lot of symptoms. One thing they don't tell you about colorectal cancer is sometimes there are no symptoms. And by the time you have the symptom, my particular symptom was I was unable to eat as often, as much uh, when I would sit down for a meal. That then led to me being fatigued. That led to me having some right side abdominal pain, no other symptoms. And that was my liver swelling up from the cancer tumors that had invaded it. So if you're not familiar with metastatic, or stage four, that just means that your original cancer left its original spot and went somewhere else in your body. In my case, it was the liver because with colorectal, it's typically the liver, the lungs, or both. Um, They do say now that you can be 45 to get a colonoscopy. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's not enough. You need to be getting screened much earlier because early onset is where mine fell into play. I was in the middle of trying to figure out what was wrong with me when I turned 50 And I was eligible at 50 to have a colonoscopy. Had I been able to have one, you know, the year before, two years before, five years before, 10 years before, they may have caught that one polyp that caused this. So 
I encourage everybody, if your insurance won't pay for it, work the system. Tell them you're having problems. Do something. If you have to pay it out of pocket, find a way to pay for it. Ask people to help you. I would encourage everybody, if you're at least 30 or 35, to go ahead and get a colonoscopy. And if they tell you to come back in 10 years, tell them, no, you'll see them in two or three years. Because I feel like it's just misdiagnosed and mis misinterpreted because the symptoms are different for everybody. Mm. It's not always the standard symptoms. Yeah. Um, and then just know that with colorectal cancer, this particular one where I'm at in mine and diagnosis, they say it's incurable. So the best I can get is no evidence of disease. I had... Um, 60% of my liver removed on November the 30th. And they say they got everything in all the margins, visibly imaging, everything showed no cancer. But I have a blood panel that's telling some different story. So we'll know a little bit more in about two weeks. Um, so I just encourage everybody, be very aware of how your body operates, anything that seems out of the norm at all. Don't take the answer of, oh, you're just a female or you're just this age, sir. Don't take that answer. That answer sometimes will lead to your early death. So fight for whatever you need and try to get things covered if you can with insurance. And if not, figure out a way to pay it out of pocket. I would have paid it out of pocket if I had known um, that this was even a possibility. They were like, no, nah, no family history. No, this you're good. Wait till you're 50. The early onset is considered anything prior to 50. So 30 to 50 is the highest rising numbers right now of colorectal cancer. And it's the second leading cause of death. Mm -hmm. And that has happened just over the last 10 years. That's if that tells you anything. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out what would what would cause that to be is would it be plastics? Would it be with the food that we're eating? It's it's crazy that that that's rising that it, way. It is because if you look at the I'm in a lot of groups, I work with other patients as well. Uh, I work with the company that I have an abdominal pump. It's uh, called a HAI heptatic arterial infusion goes right to my liver. That's what got me to liver resection was to get that tumor small enough. I work with that company. So I see all ages, all demographics, all backgrounds. Some people are vegan. Some people are vegetarian. Some people are pescatarian. You see it all and nobody knows where it's coming from or why. There's no answer to why. You're seeing less colorectal cancer in the older population where it used mm -hmm. to live. Then, and you're seeing more of it now in the, in the 30, I've seen 21, 28 year olds. Um, but the 30 to 50 is, is young and they call it early onset. So I very much encourage everybody to keep an eye on your blood work. If you have questions, you can reach out to me directly. Um, I'm very easy to get a hold of. Just ask me any question you need. I'd happily answer them directly. Awesome. That's a great stopping point. Um, Hope's Given Kind will be in the show notes. Again, if you want to learn more about what she's gone through, um, in addition to contributing towards her and her family. Um, is, do you want to, do you want that to be, your uh how people would reach out to you or is there a, a different way that you would rather them do that uh you can post my email in there if you want to okay. you've got my email why don't you put that in there and they can reach out to me directly that's right. how most people that initially connect with me that's how we and they can also find me on instagram if you want to put that link up there as well okay. my instagram handles on there perfect perfect and if they want to do yoga you're still uh you're still doing that right i'll be back february 2nd i took two months off okay. for my liver resection all right. So and I'm what, back at it. <laughs> what, uh, and uh, where could they find that? Uh, I teach at Southern Home on Woodruff Road next to Whole Foods. And I also teach downtown at Poe West, a studio called Shine Ohm. So I'm, I can be found all over in a couple of different studios. And if I do well in the next few months, I might add a few more classes. Awesome. Well, good stuff. Well, Hope, thank you so much. That was Hope Brooks, everyone. Uh, rock star, cancer warrior single mom, all of those great things, in addition to being a landlady on the side, but not a greedy one. Un unlike what's, <laughs> not greedy. <laughs> unlike what people, actually, what people think. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> actually, <laughs> you're very greedy. Um, but uh, but Hope, thank you so much. Um, and and really appreciate you taking the time. And and I know that just with all that you're going through that, that you know, this adding this to your schedule was something. So I appreciate that. Uh, incredibly. So thank you so much. Um, for those of you that are listening, please go to the show notes and please look up those things. My contact information will be in the show notes as always as well. If you need a realtor, uh, as I already said, please like, rate, review, subscribe to the show, all of those good things. And we will talk again next time.